This is actually one of my favourite pictures in the gallery, so it's absolutely amazing that I get to treat her. It's really funny as well that she's called the Ugly Duchess because she is clearly one of the most beautiful pictures in the gallery. When you look at how she's been painting, I mean, Quentin Masters is an absolute master. The way the veil has been painted, it's, it's got these brighter passages to make the waves of, of the veil. But what he's also done is he's, he's scratched into the paint as well. So not only has he got the, the lighter paint, he's also got the light catching the paint. So it really sort of like gives it this like three dimensionality, which is just absolutely astonishing. And it's quite similar as well in the headdress. You've got all of this sort of like texture that really comes out because of the way that he's been scratching into the paint and creating this texture. The brushwork is absolutely fantastic as well. If you look at how beautifully rendered the hand is, the brush strokes are so fine and it's so three dimensional. And it's, it's interesting that hands are what artists often struggle with. It's often the point that, that they fall down, but this is just perfect. It's absolutely beautiful. The Ugly Duchess, actually, that nickname came because um, she was used as a model for John Tenniel's illustrations of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland character of the Duchess. Quentin Massey, so a little bit like Leonardo um, himself, had quite a fascination for images of the grotesque and, and the ugly. Um, it's something that they had a connection with, which is why these drawings seem to link Leonardo to Quentin Massey's. This painting's up here um, in conservation because it's going into an exhibition in the spring. She came into the collection in 1947 um, as a bequest and when she actually entered uh, the gallery she had an enlarged shoulder, she had a plinth underneath this shelf and her background was painted black. There was a lot of flaking um, on the surface. And so a little while after she entered the collection, she was sent off to a private restorer to be cleaned and repaired. Um, and when they did that work, they did some work to the panel that she's painted on. There's a join down the, the side here. They did some work to rejoin that. They removed the addition that was on the bottom, this, this um, plinth, and they attached a cradle to the back of the painting, um, which is a reinforcement um, that we often see around that time. What they also did was um, clean off this unoriginal black background. We're not 100% sure of when that was actually applied to the painting, but since the recent conservation treatment, we've actually discovered quite a lot about what's happened to this painting and its history over the years. And it's really quite interesting that around the same sort of time that she arrived at the gallery, another painting came onto the art market, um, I think in Paris, that was this gentleman over here, the old man, who's in a private collection now. At that time, art historians identified them as a pair. Both have been proposed as depictions of certain historical characters, but none that would indicate a contemporary portrait. Instead, and particularly the Duchess with her enlarged forehead and masculine features and her warts and the very low cut bodice and limp rosebud. And instead, they really seem to identify as satirical characters very much in the vein of Leonardo's grotesque drawings, but elevated here to a much more sophisticated art form. So the recent conservation treatment has been carried out. Um, it's been a full treatment. You can see here the raking light photograph that was taken before the painting was treated. It shows how the cradle that had been applied to the back in the 1940s was starting to cause problems with the panel. There's a slight washboarding effect that had begun across the, the, the top edge of the painting here and the join had begun opening up at the bottom and that's a direct link to how the cradle was causing problems for the panel. So I removed the cradle, I rejoined the painting and I also removed an addition that was along this left edge um, which wasn't really serving any sort of purpose at all. At that point the, the painting now that it's rejoined it's perfectly um, strong and able to live without a reinforcement. The painting was also cleaned at that point and here Again, in the raking light photograph, you can just see a cleaning test. So the varnish was quite yellow. There's quite a difference in how, um, how she looked. And a lot of the details really came out, even though she hadn't appeared that dirty. So many of the details really came out and, and made a big difference into how we can view her.
if the two paintings were conceived as a pair, it's quite interesting that they have um, these different backgrounds. What we see now, they, the, the two paintings look different because they have a different conservation history, but they actually would have looked different when they were first painted as well. We don't know of any other versions of the Duchess, but there is a contemporary study of the old man in Paris, which has got a creamy white background. It's just the head and shoulders and it's painted on paper, so it's most likely to be a worked up drawing. And then the subsequent painting that we see was given the gesturing hands and the shelf that allows him to interact with her. So we know that he was already conceived with a white background, and when you look closely, you can see the white underlayer beneath the dark green glaze that we can now see on top. Instead of white beneath the dark green glaze, the Duchess actually has a light green underlayer. Her background was heavily reworked in the past, and it was clearly also very damaged. The cleaning revealed remnants of a dark green glaze on the surface that had been previously suppressed. And we've got other 16th century Netherlandish paintings in the collection with this type of background. But the cleaning also exposed the remains of some other layers. The light green had clearly had a dark green glaze on top of it, but on top of that glaze, there was also a white layer with another dark green glaze on top of that. And that seems to replicate the layer buildup of the old man. I found this to be a quite an interesting puzzle, really, in the link between the two paintings. Subtle changes in a layer buildup can lead to quite different optical effects that we often see. So in this case, the same dark green glaze would look different if it was painted on top of a white or a green underlayer. The Duchess could never have had a white background because of her white veil. She would have just melted into the surroundings. And the old man, as we've seen, has already been conceived as having a white background. So perhaps she was given the fairly common green underlayer and when both of them were, were glazed green, they didn't quite work as a pair. Maybe she was then subsequently painted white and reglazed so they would match better. It's a question that we're currently looking at with the scientific department, but it's something we might not actually ever have an ultimate answer to. What we've essentially been looking at since the treatment in the 1940s is a restored underlayer. The remnants of the damaged dark glaze had been suppressed and she had a very odd mottled pastel green background. The treatment that I'm doing now gives us the opportunity to readdress the appearance of the background using the evidence of what we found left on the surface underneath the repaints during the cleaning. I've already retouched the damages over the join and I've reintegrated the damage and the wear in the light green underlayer. It would be one step too far to try and recreate the upper layers of white and green that we found because there's not enough left to go on. But she looks really raw without the glaze that she was designed to have. So I'm working with the remnants of the first green glaze that we can see quite clearly. And so based on what's still there, I'm trying to bring the background together sympathetically, but much more convincingly than the previous restoration. When I've been working on the background, it's really important that it's really clean, um, which is why my palette, normally my palette's really messy like this, um, but I've actually, there's, there's only a few pigments that are in the background and I'm trying to keep it really clean so it can be quite sort of, I, I can really um, clarify where I'm putting an opaque pigment, where I'm putting a glazing pigment because um, any disruption in the background and the underlayer is really going to show up if I try and put any glazes on top of it. So I have to try and keep the pigments really quite, um, quite clean and quite dry. So this is ivory black, which is a fairly uh, transparent, warm black. This is Prussian blue, um, which is um, a very highly colouring, quite deep blue. Um, it's quite a modern pigment. This is manganese blue. And between the two of these and um, yellow, either a, a cadmium or Naples yellow or an Indian yellow, depending on how transparent you want something to be, both of the blues are fairly transparent. Um, but I can either make a transparent green like this or an opaque green like this, depending on whether I use an opaque or a transparent yellow. And then I've just got some other pigments that are just like warming up the palette a little bit um, so I can create maybe a slightly muddier effect or some of the um, effect that you might get when um, you have the aging of oil paint that darkens um, and slightly discolors and warms up the paint.